So I'm Erica Ocampo, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Metals Company. Um, my background is in engineering and sustainability, and I have worked for manufacturing for over 15 years. So I would like to start today by introducing you to the Metals Company's mission, which is our intent is to build a carefully managed metal commons that will be used, recovered, and reused for Mylenia. So to get there, we have a tree-prone approach. And chapter one is what is taking us to um, develop this very unconventional resource in international waters, polymetallic nodules, as we are looking to be able to supply the critical minerals with the lowest environmental and social impacts. And once we reach a place with no further destruction from the planet is required, we will be able to exit primary uh, production and use the same um, process that we developed to recover the metals in spent batteries in the future. But before we get there, um, we know that the clean energy transition comes with a, an exponential demand on these minerals. And unfortunately, for at least the next 30 years, recycling alone won't be able to close that gap because we just don't have enough recycling stock and the world population is gonna increase by two billion humans by mid-century. So nodules have four metals in one rock, nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese. The entire mass of these rocks can be turned into usable products. And they sit unattached on the sea floor with no overburden to remove, which means we can collect them without digging, drilling, or blasting. And this is an area where there are no rainforests or coral reefs. The nodules that TMC is focusing on, they are located west, west of Mexico, southeast of Hawaii, in an area in international waters called Clarion Clipeter Zone, or CCZ. This area is equal to 1.2% of the entire ocean. And it is estimated to have bigger resources than the global land reserves for nickel, cobalt, and manganese. So in this graph, you can see on the blue bar, the resources on the CCZ versus the gray bar, which are the resources on land. So the color in that area, the blue, the red, and the yellow are the contracted areas that TMC has access to. So in the resource statements issue for our Nori and Tomo, those areas are sponsored by the Republic of Nauru and, and the Kingdom of Tonga, respectively. They have enough nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese to electrify the entire passenger car fleet of the US. And given the location in the CCZ and the abundance of this resource, and that is already on board of a ship once collected, this alternative is a real potential solution just right off the US western seaboard, which is just like 1,500 miles west of where we are today. So earlier this year, the Nori and Tomol areas were ranked by mining.com as the world largest underdeveloped nickel projects. The activities that we do on the CCZ are governed by a group, uh, an organization called the International Seabed Authority. It's an intergovernmental organization composed of 167 member states plus the European Union. It was established in 1994 as a directed by the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which was an international, is an international treaty that was reached in 1982. Something really unique about the ISA that they're doing is that the CC said they have already set up 43% of this area has a preservation area, never to be touched, which is a much larger area than the areas which you can see in, um, in yellow, which had been given for contracts for exploration. So when I first heard about deep sea mining, it really took me a second to like process what it was. But once I look at it through a planetary systems perspective, it just really makes sense. So think about it. The oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface. And most of life on Earth lives on land, with 3% of biomass residing on the ocean versus 97% residing on land. And um, because the ocean is really vast, you'll think that there's a lot of life there, but actually many areas lack vegetation that means that the opportunities for life to evolve are pretty limited. So now I think it's very important for you to understand that there are different mineral resources that can be developed in the deep sea. So let's start with cobalt crust. Cobalt crust are, cover, are these flanks of sea mountains covered with cobalt, uh, 800 to 2500 meters deep. 
They have abundant food sources, so they attract sharks and tuna. Then we have seafloor massive sulfites, which are formed by hydrothermal vents. And they are different ecosystem uh, because they actually are fed through the energy rich chemical compounds from the vents themselves. But uh, these two resources, the first ones, uh, they actually need uh, machinery to cut through the rock. But then if we go deeper, 4,000 to 6,000 meters deep, we are in a region called the abyssal plain. Here is where the polymetallic nodules sit. This ecosystem is one of the lowest biomass environments on the planet. And it happens to be the most abundant habitat type on the ocean, uh, covering 70% of the ocean seafloor. And the environment here is um, shaped by the lack of light, uh, very high pressures, low temperatures, and low food availability. If you were to line up the different ecosystems or biomes on the planet from the richest to the poorest, calculating it through the contained carbon per square meter, you will have rainforest from Indonesia on the highest spectrum between 15 to 30 kilograms per square meter of contained carbon. And then you will have the abyssal plains towards the lowest poorest side with just 10 grams per square meter of contained carbon. So um, if you were to, if you wanna be looking at what a polymetallic nodule field looks like, this is it. This is something that you can look for many, many hours and it will just look like this. Um, this week has been a very important week for the metals company. We're very excited because we were able to announce the completion of our collector pilot test. And this was really important, not only because we were able to demonstrate the operational capabilities of our collector system, but also because it's the one, the single most important milestone when it comes to generating environmental impact data. So now I would like to share with you a little video of our environmental program. I'm Katie Allen, I'm Lead Offshore Client Representative and Environmental Associate for The Metals Company. My role is to implement the Nori D Environmental Monitoring and Geotechnical Program at sea. The purpose of this campaign is to test the technical performance of a prototype nodule collector vehicle and to measure and investigate the immediate impacts of that vehicle in a controlled area of the seabed. You can think of this as an experiment with three phases. The first phase is the baseline and monitoring support program. This phase involves collecting information about the natural state of the ecosystem prior to impact and disturbance. Phase two is the collector test monitoring program where all the collector activities are happening. This is where the impact to the ecosystem is occurring and we will be measuring the effects of that in real time. There will be simultaneous mapping and sampling operations occurring with AUVs, ROVs and CTDs. These instruments will look at, listen to and collect the relevant information that we need about the ecosystem. And finally, we have phase three, which is our post-collector program, where we repeat all the previous work scopes of our previous baseline work. We will use these data sets to understand and assess how these ecosystems are responding to the impact. undertaking one of the most comprehensive deep sea research programs in history. The scientific insights we gain from this research will fill fundamental knowledge gaps about the deep sea environment. Most importantly, it will form part of an open source scientific data set that the international community can access and benefit from. So in this campaign, uh, the engineers were able to uh, drive the pilot collector vehicle and lift 3,000 tons of nodules of the surface of this uh, collection um, uh, vessels, and they were 4,000 kilometers up, right? So that was a big achievement, but uh, if in case you were wondering what uh, 3,000 uh, tons of nodules look like, 
this uh, little mountain is inside the hold of the hidden gem. So in this last campaign uh, that we did with our partner OCs, we were also able to uh, test the first prototype with Consber of the digital twin, which is a key component of what will be our adapted management system. And while to us, the adapted management system will enable us to have, you know, in real time environmental and operational management of our activities out there, it also means that for our uh, regulators and key stakeholders that they will have ears and eyes of our operations out there. So just because we are planning to operate far offshore doesn't mean that we have to be out of sight. Um, this is just a slide that shows you that the entire nodule can be processed and we have worked with HASH and SGS on developing a near zero solid uh, waste processing metallurgical plant and everything can be created from that nodule. And last, I'm gonna talk to you and give you a little sneak peek of the LCA that we're in, in charge of VMI to do, where we compare the life cycle impacts of our NORID project with various different routes to getting these nodules from terrestrial routes. So this slide only shows you the global warming potential, and as you can see, the lowest impact comes from the nodules from the NORID area as compared to all the other uh, review routes. And the table below, I know it's a lot of data, but it shows other impact categories, environmental impact categories, and also the NORID uh, project has the lowest impact categories of all of that. This is our timeline. We are really looking to be able to submit an application for exploitation contract next year, and then it will take about a year for that process to be reviewed. So thank you for your time.